Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming this evening. Welcome to the Frontline Club. Um, before I hand over to Michael Goldfarb, who will chair tonight's discussion, if I can just ask you to switch your phones to silent. And when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because uh, we are recording this evening's uh, discussion. Over to Michael. Hi, thank you all for coming out on a cold winter's night. I appreciate <laughs> it. It's nice of you to arrive and, and talk about America's shifting foreign policy, what, what the foreign policy of the second Obama term might look like. It's, um, it's nonstop for the president. In fact, uh, yesterday, his predecessor as a Democrat in the White House, Bill Clinton, broke cover and criticized him harshly for his approach to Syria and reports it was an off-the-record meeting uh, with John McCain, of all people, but somehow it leaked out, and I think intentionally. I think Bill Clinton called Obama a wuss. A wussy. What? Now that's, a wolf. That, that's getting to be <laughs> pretty harsh. Thing, uh, things, wolf. Are, <coughs> things are always difficult. And, and the second term for a president is always seen as the term where he makes his impact on the world, since he doesn't have to fight for re-election ever again. Um, so we'll hear about that. It is a very, very good panel, and it's well balanced. We have two people from the sharp end, people who, who are journalists and who've been covering the impact of decisions made in Washington, and then two distinguished thinkers who take a broad view. And let me introduce them to you. This is Kim Gattis, who is currently the BBC State Department correspondent and has occupied um, the, the very movable bubble that accompanies uh, secretaries of state, and particularly one as peripatetic as Hillary Clinton. And she's just written a book about that experience, The Secretary, A Journey with Hillary Clinton from Beirut to the Heart of American Power. And that's the book for sale over here, and I'm sure she'll be happy to sign them afterwards. Then there's Nick Schifrin. Nick works for ABC News as a foreign correspondent here in London. He's, um, he's been bureau chief in both Kabul and Islamabad. He has uh, had to cover um, the consequences of decisions made in the Obama White House, including drone strikes in the region. Um, and then beyond Nick, and actually, he's made a tremendous transition, has Nick. He now covers the royal family almost <laughs> exclusively. <laughs> because now, now that he's based in London, that's apparently all they want him to do. Are they in but their second American term? Yeah. Are uh, they in their second term? And term? Trying to define yes. their legacy. And, and what, what would be very interesting to know is whether the mm. NSC, NSA mm. monitors their um, communication. <laughs> well, the other well, way we around. Know the the we know that <laughs> yeah. the police well, the other did. Way around. We, we've heard squidgy tapes and all those other things, those of us who are old enough to remember. Oh so gosh. we know they do get monitored, but it's exactly. a question of whether the NSA does. And then there's uh, Professor Michael Cox, who is professor at the uh, LSE, professor of international relations, and is the author, editor, and co-editor of several books, mm. including The Rise and Fall of the American Empire. The and I'm sure we'll hear about that. Mm -hmm. From Bush to Obama, U.S. Presidents and Democracy Promotion, and U.S. Foreign Policy and Soft Power. And then at the end is Dana Allen, who is a senior fellow for U.S. Foreign Policy and Transatlantic Affairs, and editor of the epically named Survival. I know of no think tank journal called Survival. And it's about global politics and strategy. And he's at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. And his most recent um, book is The Sixth Crisis, Iran, Israel, America, and the Rumors of War, which I think is a really apt phrase. Anyway, what I'd like to do, there'll be plenty of time for questions, is at least start by asking um, Kim to s for everyone to just state briefly, <coughs> three, four minutes, an overview. And that'll be a good way to get started and get some ideas introduced into the conversation. And I'll start with Kim. Thank you very much, Michael, for the uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be at the Frontline Club because I've heard a lot about the, the club, but I've never had the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm not only somebody who's reported on the decisions, uh, the impact of decisions made in Washington, but someone who also lived on the receiving end of those uh, decisions, because I was born in Beirut during the Civil War in the late 70s, and I lived there my whole life uh, until I moved to uh, Washington five years ago to be the State Department's correspondent uh, for the BC. 
But when I was in Beirut, I was uh, born on the front lines, lived on the front lines, and living in that war and the chaos uh, that it meant for my family and I really made me want to become a journalist. Um, I grew up with a lot of questions about American power, wondering um, why the United States couldn't do more for us, even when it was doing certain things, we felt that it wasn't enough or that it wasn't the right thing. So growing up asking myself, asking myself those questions, uh, I became a journalist trying to um, explain the world better to myself and, and others. And then five years ago, I found myself in Washington as the State Department correspondent, reporting on some of those decisions being made in Washington. Um, and it all came together, uh, those two aspects of uh, my life, uh, living on the receiving end, of, de of decisions made in Washington and then reporting on them and realizing that questions about American power and about American foreign policy, the questions that I had asked myself as a child were still very much out there. Wherever I went with Condoleezza Rice or Hillary Clinton, I would find echoes of the questions that had haunted me as a child. Uh, questions that we are still asking ourselves today. How much power does America still have? Um, is it in decline? Uh, what does it mean for the rest of the world? And that's why I decided to write the secretary to address some of those questions for a wide uh, audience. Now, one of the themes uh, in, uh, in my writing was to really describe how the making of American foreign policy actually works for a wide audience. Because there are a lot of misconceptions, I think, out there uh, about how much or, or about how those decisions are made and how much um, power the US has to implement them. Uh, there is still this image out there of an omnipotent superpower, uh, perhaps less so than before, but there are often reactions when the US isn't doing uh, what we would like it to do. There are often reactions to that and people asking, well, why doesn't the US just intervene and stop the conflict in Syria? And no doubt um, the conflict in Syria is something that we will be uh, discussing, but I'm also exploring uh, American power in the 21st century, how it is changing at a time when other countries are rising and challenging uh, American uh, influence in the world. More and more countries want to have uh, a say in how the world is run, not just the big ones like China, but also other smaller uh, rising powers like Turkey, uh, like Indonesia, but also Brazil. And over the course of the last four years, as I traveled around the world with Hillary Clinton and observed uh, the, uh, the uh, implementation of foreign policy or the, the making of, of, of foreign policy under the Obama administration, I found that whether consciously or unconsciously, uh, the Obama administration was trying to redefine how America exercises power in the 21st century to harness the change that it was witnessing with the rise of those uh, other powers. Uh, to try not to block it, but to work with it. Um, and that's, you know, that goes into the themes that both Michael and, and Dana explore in some, of their, uh, in some of their writings. And of course, the question now, having seen Hillary Clinton trying to redefine with uh, President Obama how, how America exercises uh, American power, uh, trying to improve perceptions of the US after some damage done to America's credibility, um, it has uh, laid the foundation for a new way of doing business uh, around the world, and that gives the opportunity for someone like John Kerry and Susan Rice, of course, who's just been appointed National Security Advisor, to actually get some things done. And at the top of their agenda is Syria, of course. Uh, we'll discuss in more details what can be done, uh, but the appointment of Susan Rice will be very interesting to determine how the next four years of the um, Obama presidency will play out. Okay, let me move on to Nick. I, uh, <coughs> I think that um, we're at the beginning of the second term, and, and I'm not sure I entirely agree with Kim, and we could talk about this, but I, I still think that we have an Obama administration that is struggling to define the Obama <coughs> doctrine and struggling to define what it wants its legacy to be uh, in the world. Uh, on the one hand, we see some good signs or some positive signs of trying to create this legacy. We saw what is really a very significant speech a couple weeks ago by the president uh, talking about drones and talking about Guantanamo and his desire, again, to close Guantanamo, but more importantly, to try and redefine uh, how to corral this uh, exploding drone program. And this is a program, remember, started by Bush, but was absolutely tripled or quadrupled down by this president. Um, and so he has said, you know, to, uh, he said in that speech, all wars must end, including 
this war, this covert war that the CIA has been fighting. And it seemed to me an attempt to try and define that legacy, to try and say we are going to move beyond the post 9-11 world. We're going to try and recreate what we do in the world. So that's a positive sign. Another positive sign uh, is a real tilt, uh, shift toward Asia. And I'm sure we'll talk about that tonight. But in many respects, we still see the Obama White House, we still see the foreign policy apparatus of the United States um, doing crisis management, uh, and, and lots of it, to be honest. And, and a lot of it isn't going so well, at least you know, a lot of people think that. Obviously, Syria uh, is the main example. I mean, uh, we saw the UN today put out a stat of how many people have died in Syria. And I looked this up. The, at the worst moment in Iraq, 3,000 people were dying a month. Today, 5,000 people are dying a month in Syria. It's extraordinary. And there are very few people who think that it's not a total failure what, or I shouldn't say very few people, but a lot of people think that it is a total failure what the U.S. has done. And Bill Clinton last night suggested that a lot more needs to be done. Um, and so the question is, where does the White House, where does the foreign policy apparatus go from here? Do they try and create a more interventionist legacy? Do they try and create an Obama doctrine that is really distinct from what we've seen uh, that's relatively tentative uh, in the last few months and, and, and the first administration? And I, I think Kim's absolutely right. We need to watch Susan Rice. Uh, and and it's it, an amazing dynamic to watch Susan Rice uh, and, and Power, Samantha Power, the new UN ambassador, uh, be announced together because when Samantha Power was a journalist. She interviewed, um, she interviewed Rice, uh, and Rice said, speaking about Clinton's inability to um, uh, intervene in Rwanda, she said, if I ever face such a crisis, I would come down on the side of dramatic action going down in flames if I had to. Uh, and it'll be really interesting to see if she can actually push the president to that because there's no evidence there's no sign that President Obama would ever go down in flames, especially for a civil war in the Middle East. And so I think in many ways we can talk about drones, we can talk about Gitmo, we can talk about Afghanistan and Iraq, but Syria in many ways will define this president's legacy. Uh, and that is really up in the air right now. Professor Cox. Michael. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And my autobiography is nowhere near as interesting as yours. I was born in Kent, which was <laughs> decidedly boring. Um, and the only, my major, in, in, contact with American powers outside the American Embassy in 1968 where a British policeman <laughs> hit me over the head um, for demonstrating against Vietnam. A, that shows you how old I am and B, how far I go back. Actually, the one thing I will say straight away is the serious sense of relief I felt in November 2008 when the Republicans lost. And, uh, and to be perfectly honest, I never quite got over that. And this, to some very large degree, still shapes my views of this administration. Anything but the Republicans, and particularly the Republicans we've got in now. So, as Mrs. T used to say, the darling Margaret, it's all about alternatives. <laughs> and we've got the best we've got, even if we don't quite like what we've got. Um, and I have to say also that one has to give him some credit for saving the world from a world depression. Um, if it had been left to Mrs. Merkel or our current ridiculous government in this country, we may have had one. Um, we haven't had one. And I have to say, God bless Bernanke and God bless Obama. They actually have done ra rather the correct things on this. And let's not forget where we were back in 2008, post Lehman Brothers and all the rest. I'm also rather keen on non-intervention, having seen so many ridiculous ones over the last 10 years. I think the US strategy on Syria is entirely right. It is no answer to anything, but the idea of the US getting involved in another damn war with no end in sight, against whom and for what we do not know, would strike me as the craziest thing the US can do. And I think the, the President is caught in the most appalling dilemma. And uh, making choices here, which are either right or wrong, are not going to please everybody. Let me just say three broad points about the way in which I think this administration has been conceived and understood by most writers. Dana, I know, is going to deal with the first one. It's the kind of liberal who betrayed the revolution. That is to say, there's a lot of people out there in the, in the, in the liberal intelligentsia in North London and parts of Washington, no doubt, who are deeply, deeply unhappy with what Obama has and has not done. 
Um, I never think one should con conceive that liberalism is going to be the guide to American foreign policy, even though I've written on American democracy promotion. I think he's done the best with a very difficult situation, and one shouldn't be so surprised that he's acted like an American president. I think, as Dana will explain, if you actually read what Obama actually said before he became president, as opposed to what one many liberals hoped he would do, actually much of what he has done has corresponded to what he said he would do, which is actually carry on the war on terror, although he didn't want to call it that. So the one way of thinking about Obama very quickly is the liberal who betrayed the revolution. I, I, I think this is not terribly helpful, but there's a lot of people out there in that particular camp. The second big theme really on America, which I've been thinking about and talking about, and it's been hinted at by both our previous speakers, whether or not the United States is still the superpower in the world, or to put, put it in another way, is it in decline? There's been a lot of talk about American decline, actually since 1968. The thing is, the damn thing won't do it. <laughs> Everybody keeps talking it's going to do it, but in the end, the damn, damned Americans don't quite do it enough. They're not like the British, or the Ottomans, or the Austro-Hungarians, who did <laughs> decline properly. So there is something really quite exceptional here about the United States. I am still one of the great uh, skeptics about the notion of American decline. I think there is a lot of talk about it, and much of the narrative, particularly amongst academics, is about it. And actually, the Chinese themselves actually have bought into this idea with, I think, some rather disastrous consequences for their own foreign policy in Asia. However, I'm not so sure about it. The third point I make, and I'll conclude here, Chair, I think we should actually be talking a lot about what I call risism, not declinism. What do I mean by risism? Namely, I think what will define this presidency, first and second term, is it, it's the ability of this presidency to look at the changing character of power in this world, the rising powers. And not just China, India, the BRICS. In a sense, he's Jim O'Neill in the White House, this man, um, in terms of the BRICS and all the rest of it. However, unlike one of the earliest speakers, I'm not so sure this is a fundamental challenge to the United States. I think it poses challenges, difficulties, but I'm not sure, and judging by the recent discussions between China and the United States, I think this is something the United States is, will be able in the end to manage. And that is going to be its great test over the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. And Dana? Thanks. Um, I, I will shadow much of what Mick has already said, but let me just maybe say it from a slightly different perspective. I mean, I think that Obama expressed himself perhaps most authentically at his um, West Point speech in January 2009, so after he'd been in office for one year, when he expressed a kind of small c Eisenhower conservatism. Um, and this is not to say that, uh, and this conservatism is not, and I think Mick has made this point very, and you know, it's, it's one of his crucial contributions, it's not anti-Keynesian. I mean, he's a, he's, he's, a, he's a conventional Keynesian, and therefore correct Keynesian. But, um, uh, and you may have noted that the panic about the American deficit has now been buried under the weight of reality, which is that it's <laughs> shrinking rapidly in relation to, to a growing economy, a slowly growing economy, admittedly, but a growing economy. Um, but he was cons he's conservative about America's position in the world in the sense that I think he felt, and he certainly expressed it in his West Point speech, mm. that a kind of permanent state of war is debilitating to America's domestic political economy mm. and to fairly ambitious liberal goals that, he, that he's uh, expressed. Uh, I think he also felt that there was a, I mean, he didn't just feel this, he expressed this, that America had gotten into a kind of structural moral deficit simply by pissing too many people off too quickly in the reaction um, to 9-11. So what he's been undertaking has been a kind of managed uh, retrenchment of US, com U.S. commitments, especially in the Middle East. Now, this is hardly a radical uh, reversal. And I think what's going to come out in the discussion tonight is that circumstances and events are working against it. It's difficult to retrench. I mean, we talked about Syria. Um, I think we could find ourselves in a shooting war with Iran based on commitments that he, uh, that he has maintained. Um, He's tried to avoid it, but he's also mm. drawn a fairly clear red line. So my first point, to conclude, my first point is that his retrenchment is, can only be seen as radical 
in the context of the, the, the Bush wars of, of the first decade of the century, um, which were, you know, which were radical. Um, and the second point, as Mick uh, tr suggested, goes to the disappointment that many on the left have expressed. And of course, we have um, a, a lot of it this week, I guess, due to prism and so forth. I would put it this way. I would say uh, slightly differently. Obama is, a cl is an American liberal, which means by definition he's relatively hawkish in military <laughs> terms. Um, he is in the tradition of John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and Bill Clinton, no matter what kind of trash talking Bill Clinton's been doing. Um, and this is an important point. He never, never promised to you know, dismantle America's commitments in the, around the world or even a fairly aggressive military posture. What he did say is that, and I already said this, after 9-11, America overreacted and lost its way. It fought a stupid war in Iraq and it practiced torture. And these were the two big things he promised to end and he has ended them. Um, but targeted drone strikes, which are an admittedly um, astonishing thing. Um, Libya, PRISM, even as I suggested, and maybe we can discuss it, military action against Iran are all consistent with the platform he ran on in 2008. Um, and um, again, we can get back to this. I, 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 I'm tempted to say something about Syria. Um, but maybe I won't. Okay. <laughs> I'll, we'll get, we'll I'll, get, I'll get to it. We'll get yes. to it then. Good. Okay, great. Um, so I, j just making notes, this is, it's wonderful to listen to you that um, I have a bunch of questions immediately. Is there a time, is this a time even to consider a doctrine or an overarching vision for any democratic president facing the exceptional intransigence of of a Republican-dominated House of Representatives and an overwhelming media uh, that, that, that has hived off 40 percent of the people from even hearing your message. Is this a time to consider doctrines? Maybe it isn't. Crisis management. Nick, you were talking about um, how interesting it was that Susan Rice had been appointed. And Kim, you're going to be covering John Kerry. My experience tells me that when there's a strong person close to the president at the NSA and someone with great experience at the State Department, bang, bang, bang. That's not good for an overarching doctrine or approach to foreign affairs. The economy, we'll end up talking, I'm certain tonight, mostly about, about Syria and the Middle East and drones and, and the kinds of things that we foreign correspondents cover. But you know, the economy really is the key foreign issue, isn't it now, for all the bloodshed in the world how this is organized, how this global economy is organized in a way that I suppose fits liberal principles is a genuine challenge and it's not one that be can be managed domestically. And then I'm really interested to hear about shooting war with Iran, Dana, because mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm, no, wonder you, no wonder you call your magazine survival. <laughs> but <laughs> what, what, what I'd like to do talk. is start with Kim and take advantage of her presence here and say, in this White House, in this administration, how, how does a basic decision on foreign policy get made? Does it get made at Foggy Bottom with the Secretary of State, or is it made at the Oval Office in the West Wing? The final decision rests with the President, and I think that's not unusual. I think every uh, White House has operated like that, with more or less input from either the National Security Advisor or a Secretary of State, depending on the personalities. But this White House has also uh, been much more controlling of the process. Uh, because of the kind of person that uh, President Obama is. Uh, but I don't really subscribe to the idea that uh, Hillary Clinton had no influence. Uh, there were many moments where she did have influence, um, and one of the key examples is Libya, uh, for example. She had a way of working with the president um, where she was seen as the steady hand of experience, and she uh, weighed in uh, on decision-making <coughs> Uh, in ways that were not necessarily apparent to the public. Could I just interrupt you quickly? Keep your, that thought, but I mean, did they meet one-to-one -to, -one to discuss this stuff? Every week. 
and, and that and was one of the preconditions for her taking the job. Right. She wanted to make sure that she had access to the president on a regular basis because she understood that he was surrounded by the people who were loyal to him, that she was not part of his inner circle, and that if she was going to have any sort of influence as Secretary of State, she needed to have direct access to the president. She was not Condoleezza Rice, who was <laughs> already close to the president. But even Condi Rice lost a lot of the battles. I mean, she lost out often to you know, Cheney or, or Rumsfeld. So um, you know, it's, it's not unusual for a Secretary of State not to win uh, a, a debate or dis uh, an agreement, um, a discussion with, uh, with the president. But in the first year of Clinton at the State Department, she was very keen on showing that she was going to be loyal to the president. That you know, was her utmost priority, to show the president and the people around him that she was not coming with her own agenda, that she was not coming with you know, her Hillary land to take over or to overshadow the president. And in the following three years, she had a lot more influence. Whatever disagreements they had, uh, they were not aired in public because there was a conscious decision made within this administration and also by Clinton herself and probably the president that they did not want to see the infighting uh, made public the way it had been done during the Bush administration because that also undermined America's credibility. Okay, then let me just quickly set you back on the course of, mm -hmm. tell us about Libya. Can, how did she influence him to do something that we got the sense he may not really have wanted to do? He is a much more reluctant president than most people mm. would want to see. Um, and just to go back just very briefly to something Nick said, I, it's true there isn't necessarily a, a doctrine, um, and it is not clear what Clinton or even Obama's legacy really is um, at this stage, but I don't think we can underestimate the point where the U.S. was in 2008, because the U.S. was on a trajectory between the financial crisis and the rise of mm. other powers where the mm -hmm. talk of decline was accelerating. Yeah. And there is something to be said for the adjustment of the trajectory that Obama and Clinton yeah. uh, tried to uh, you know, shape. So that is an intangible but longer lasting uh, legacy. <coughs> On Libya, Clinton did what she often did, which was to um, gather the facts and come to the president with those facts and slant th the discussion from the onset towards a conclusion that she wanted him to reach. So on Libya, at the onset, President Obama was simply not keen to embark in a war when he was the president who was supposed to be winding down wars and certainly not in another Arab and Muslim country. But there came a point when Clinton started to become convinced that something had to be done. She is much more forward-leaning than the president, and I think that that was yeah. one point of friction between them. So she felt that it wasn't possible to just sit on the sidelines and that something had to be done. But she also understood that this was no longer a time when the US was going to foot the whole bill, and do it all on its own, unilaterally, etc. So once the Arab League had called for a no-fly zone, and they saw that there was regional ownership for trying to solve this problem. Was that an independent development? Or were they, were they encouraged from the they White were, House? They were possibly being encouraged, but it was very much coming from the region. The GCC, the Gulf um, Cooperation Council, and the Arab League both called for a no-fly zone. I was on a plane with her. We were going to uh, Paris in the middle of March of 2011 for a G8 meeting of foreign ministers. And she by then was already convinced that something had to be done, but she wanted to see whether it was possible to get all the, all the elements aligned. So she met with the French and the British to see where they were on this no-fly zone and whether they realized that a no-fly zone was simply not going to be enough, actually, to end the violence. She met with the Qataris and the Emiratis to see whether the Arabs were really ready to put their mouth where their money was. Because it's easy to call on America to take action and then sit back and say, hey, you know, you're bombing another Muslim country. And then she sat with the Libyan opposition leader, also in Paris. It was the first uh, meeting of, of, of the sort um, to assess you know, what their vision was, whether there was someone they could work with. Um, it's never perfect, and you know we can get into the discussion about whether um, you know you ever know really the opposition, and that question is still there with Syria. And then she uh, had slowly been working on the Russians to make sure that if the U.S. did go with others 
to the Security Council that there would be no Russian veto. Once she got all that, she went back to the president, made her case, and the natural conclusion that President Obama could come to was, okay, we can do this because there is regional ownership, it is multilateral, um, and we're not going to foot the whole bill or do it all on our own. Uh, interestingly enough, after the UN resolution was voted, calling for a no-fly zone and all necessary measures to protect civilians, and the military action started, the Qataris and the Emiratis didn't show up with their jets. And Clinton had to call them and say, this is important for me, this is important for the President of the United States, we're waiting for you. Mm. So that's how it worked. Um, okay. on and if I, let that me just jump in very jump quickly, in, yeah. because <clears throat> so I think that's a fascinating look at how Clinton was so good at this stuff. I was in Benghazi that week. Mm. And from the ground, it's very simple. If that no-fly zone hadn't passed by, what was it, Friday or Thursday? Thursday. It was Thursday. If it hadn't passed by the weekend, tens of thousands of people would have died. I mean, there is no doubt about that, that as we were all getting the hell out of Dodge and going to as far as close to Egypt as we could get, Benghazi was a sitting duck. And all of us who've been on the front lines every day in Ras Al Nuf, anywhere west, knew that while those planes were crap, and probably even missing us on purpose, because they were missing by a mile, there was a lot of mercenaries right behind them who were just happy to take their money and just flatten Benghazi. Um, and so I think, in terms of if we are going to talk about legacy, had Benghazi fallen, or had Benghazi been allowed to be raised to the ground, we would still be talking about Obama and Clinton not mm -hmm. being able to get the guts to go in there. And I think that when we talk about Syria, yeah, it is a complete disaster right now. And it might be a complete disaster to get in now. But there is an argument to made that a year ago, or a year and a half ago, if they'd taken some of the same steps that they took in the days before Benghazi, I know it's more complicated, there's a lot of ifs, but we could have had a different conversation. We might not be looking at 95 or 100,000 or 120,000 dead in Syria. Okay. Well, the, the, but to, to me, this, is, this yeah. has been a, a really instructive that there's a very actually clear line of communication and response. I mean, I, I get the sense, I understand that it's all done within the White House, mm -hmm. but her task was to rope together all of this and then yeah. bring it back to the president and then got the decision that she wanted, obviously, from Not the get. Not always, but in this case, she did. On Burma, for example, she, she got the president on board as well to right. engage towards uh, reform. She <coughs> was very much at the heart of uh, the decision making on uh, you know the Asia policy, but she lost a lot of other battles. So, I mean, on so Afghanistan, you know, she <laughs> was in favor of uh, a bigger number of troops for the surge. She didn't get there. She was in favor of less CIA involvement in Pakistan. <laughs> she didn't get that, but she did still try to, you know, get that relationship, um, um, you know, on track. And then on the Middle East peace process. You know, that first year, she was very much trying to be the good soldier, the loyal team player. She did not voice her disagreement with what she thought was the wrong approach to Middle East uh, peacemaking. That set off the administration in the wrong tra in the d wrong direction. But she also made a very, you know, um, clear politician's choice not to, mm. um, you know, hang Sorry, her Capitol. reputation what, on that what, thankless What was task. the wrong direction? Sorry, what was the wrong direction? I mean, it hasn't worked out. I it hasn't worked that out. That, I mean, but what was the know, wrong direction initially? There's a sense in Washington and, and in the region as well that focusing on settlements so much from the onset yeah. was not the right approach. But there, ha you know, you could argue it any which way because so many people have tried. The alternative to the focusing on the, uh, the uh, focusing on the settlements clearly failed because mm -hmm. Obama did not have a plan B when yes. Netanyahu said no. On the other hand. Not focusing on the settlements was a status quo view of the traditional peace process diplomacy, which had gotten nowhere. And I think the administration, I think Obama, made the proper judgment that it was, you know, the peace process was a long term um, fig leaf for continued settlement activity. So, it, I mean, it does seem to me, I, I, I interjected here because. A lot of people have the view that this was a strategic error on Obama's part to make such a big deal about the settlements. And I can see what they're saying. I, or at least I'll, I see what they're saying to the extent that I would so say this was the largest foreign policy defeat for the president in the sense of something that you feel could have gone better, but he was defeated on it. But However, he, but, he, but even what he got right was then criticized by the Republicans for having got wrong, and that was over Libya. It did strike me this was a very smart 
foreign policy, leading from behind, made absolute sense after uh, Afghanistan and after Iraq. And to let the British and the, and the French and the other Europeans lead from the front while doing most of the supply of the weaponry right, was a very smart because there was no political comeback from that and there weren't American fingerprints all over it. On, on the settlements, I mean, I've always taken the view that the Israeli-Palestinian uh, Israeli thing is almost the most insoluble of all the issues. But the most uh, important because it affects I don't think it is. I don't actually don't think it is. I actually take, take a rather revision. I don't think it is the most important. I think the most important but is yeah, Iraq. I, I, it's, it's interesting. I, I, <laughs> we're, just to go slightly to the subject, I mean, after 40 odd years, I mean, it's almost normative now that this is how, they, how it is on both sides. And um, I wonder, I wonder why, why a president would even bother to get involved unless he received extremely well. <laughs> strong, extremely strong um, uh, representations from both sides in the region to come on down uh, and help us, be, well, uh, of, which isn't this, happening. Well, one of the accusations is, of course, that it, it's an example I mean, I, of him being <laughs> overwhelmed by the power of his own eloquence yeah, I and, would think, agree and with that. thinking that, uh, you know, uh, expressing it should be enough to change things. And he found out that wasn't the case. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by this question about whether it's the most important thing or I don't whether think it it's is, not. No. I mean, I think that um, it, is, it is crucially important to the United States because it's crucially important to the future of Israel, and Israel is almost the 51st state. And in that context, and, which, and is, it's, which is the problem? And, and, well, course. you can say it's the problem, but it's also <laughs> well, it is it. It's the reality, and part of that reality is we're going to have a 51st state that is going to increasingly be involved in a in an apartheid situation but, and, but what's uh, interesting Dan, I mean that I, I, I take your point and, and I'd, I'd like to shift this over to Mick and, and say we, we were talking in that first go-round about all these other things that go on in the world and that if you come in to, to the White House and then you get reelected against against the odds it, do you sit down and make a list and say, this mm. is what I can do, this is what I can do, and this is what I can do, and you look out a, around the whole world and say, China, this, Asia policy, put something in place that'll last a decade, um, two decades, you know, shift troops around, all these things. Where would it, I mean, I don't want to get hung up on Israel yeah. so yeah. soon in the conversation, mm. so I'm going to ask Mick and, and say, if, if you were to look at, at America today and formulate a doctrine for <laughs> Obama. You want me to do where, it? Where, where, where would you start? Have What's the most important thing? Yeah. Yeah. Have a quick yeah. drink, yeah. yeah. Um, and and the rates of pay yeah. are considerably less okay. than a GS Let me just 20. say <laughs> very, very quickly where I agree with Dana on one fo well, a number of points, but his point about don't be too disappointed with Obama because he never really was a liberal in, in, in the foreign policy sense. He's a liberal in all sorts of other ways. Go back and look at his speech he made in Oslo when receiving the Peace Prize for something he'd never done. Mm. <laughs> Actually, in that speech in, in Oslo, he actually made very, it was very clear on the use of force and implicitly on drones, maybe explicitly on drones. So one should not have been surprised on all sorts of other things. The other quick point I want to come back is on what Kim said about the, the Obama achievement. I don't think it's a doctrine. Uh, I, I, know, I wouldn't want to call it a doctrine. But I do think quite often his critics, particularly on the right and especially in the United States, of which nearly everybody on the right doesn't like Obama, actually misses the point about Obama. I think Obama actually has done quite a lot either to slow down or arrest what was a perceived American decline. First, in terms of the economy, the American economy. Secondly, in terms of America's soft power in Europe, which had dropped right through the floor, particularly in countries like Germany and Britain. That was crucially important. And actually, he's taken a kind of a, di a directional lead here with, with Hillary's support on the Asia question. I mean, the tilt to Asia was, like, it's, a, it's a leadership role. I mean, in some ways, it's very weird that we have the last 10 minutes been talking about the Middle East, which is precisely what Obama doesn't want to be talking about <laughs> for the rest of his presidency. Sorry. He <laughs> wants to talk about those parts of the world which are dynamic, which are the solutions to the world economy, and, and, and all the rest. On the doctrine issue, look, every president wants a doctrine. Truman had a good one, not bad. Eisenhower had one, Kennedy had one, Nixon had one, which wasn't too bad, although most people don't like Nixon. Everybody wants to have a doctrine because that's what presidents do. They, like, they love to have a doctrine. What is, the, what is the Obama doctrine, if I could put my finger on it? I have absolutely no idea at all. Right. Other than to make sure 
that the United States doesn't get engaged in more dumb wars, <laughs> to pick out friends which it's got, partners which it can work with, and to recognize, and maybe this will be the legacy in the end, mm -hmm. that actually looking at the world today, it is the rising area of Asia, it's rising China, it is India, which are the future, and America has to position itself in such a way as to be in a leadership and a partnership role with what is going on there rather than actually resisting it. I think that will turn out to be the Obama doctrine, but let, I don't know if everybody's going to call it that. Let me just bring so, Dana back and, 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 and building on, on this point that the mix just made. How does he bring Asia in? Because you can't escape the crisis that exists from the Eastern Mediterranean <laughs> through the Persian Gulf, no matter who you are. And so how, do, how does he build alliances that, is it possible to build an alliance, do you think, so that if is, there is going to be some kind of conflict eventually with Iran, yeah. well, China, I China doesn't sit back and laugh? I, I think <laughs> that... Um, Pick up all the jobs. I think I would take a stab at saying there is, a, is, is an Obama doctrine, which is directly to this question. It's a, a doctrine um, that can be expressed uh, in strategic terms as offshore balancing. That is to say, trying to avoid land wars, but having overwhelming American air power and sea power and relying on local allies, including in Asia Pacific. Mm. Um, Except and that's not original, Dana. That's what I think. Well, no, it's not original, yeah. but it's different from what we have. No, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. Uh, let's let's go. I mean, knock I mean every country, doctrine yeah. has its moment. Sure, I mean, sure. I think the second part of it is expressed in that phrase, "leading from behind," which yeah. I always, whenever this phrase comes yeah, up, I always try to remind people. Uh, you know, this was an anonymous quote <laughs> in an article by Ryan L Lizza in the New Yorker. It was pretty obviously a joke. <laughs> okay, and don't forget that somebody Actually, made a joke. I, I was there. When, it when was that made. was uttered, and no, it was it was not exactly a joke, but it wasn't meant to signal that the U.S. was taking a back seat. It was signaling, it was it was a you know the we don't want the, our fingerprints on. Yeah. Well, no, we no, it was it was it was a, a badly phrased way of saying you know we're trying to make others take ownership take as ownership, well. You yeah. can't just always look but to the U.S. and say what are you going to do but for us. But my point and is that he's done that to yeah, a large extent. Exactly. I mean, you know, small. we were talking about about Libya. Um, I, you know, I don't think we can, uh, I mean, w whatever people's sort of political affections for the current British government or the then uh, French government, we can't, you know, leave out this crucial role that Paris and London played sure. in driving that forward. And this was very, very emblem, I mean, this fit very comfortably into Obama's view of the world, mm -hmm. which is the United States, which maintains predominant overwhelming military power, is not going to fritter away that power. Um, by always being out front, but it's going to sort of, in a sense, provide the enabling sinews of an international community. Tradition. But does the international community rise to the occasion? That's the question. In, 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 in Asia Pacific, just to go back to the question you actually asked me, um, I, um, I think there may have been, I, as you can tell, I'm a bit of a Kool-Aid drinker here, but I think there may have been an excessive level of abstraction in this idea of rebalancing and a pivot without quite taking on board how this was going to look to China. Because the <laughs> idea was to, you know, it was supposed to be a Goldilocks kind of doctrine and strategy which w in which we would reassure uh, yeah. Asia-Pacific allies and partners without... Annoying the Chinese. Without, well, without at least uh, off, creating too much, much anxiety in Beijing. So far, that's not working out so well. Although no, very badly. Yeah. Can I, can, try, can I try and take this discussion, I, I don't know if this is the way you want it to go, but discussion slightly away from the 30,000 foot level. And well, I bring that it was back the question to... Of, you, you picked up the body We're parts. We're so some of the reality. Yeah. 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 So yes, on, on a strategic uh, scale, we can look at the economy, we can look at a shift toward Asia, we can look at uh, the lack of decline. Yeah. But if you actually look at what some of the diplomats in the Middle East are doing with asking the Palestinians for certain things. Palestinians say, sorry, we're going to do it anyway. Asking the Israelis for certain things, sorry, we're going to do it anyway. The U.S. ambassador in Cairo defending the Muslim Brotherhood. And then you move a little farther east and you think about, okay, what did Obama really try and do in terms of the rhetoric and the language? This is really important. I think he's embraced that. I am a different rhetorical leader of the U.S. He went to Cairo, he gave this wonderful speech, I thought a wonderful speech about Islam and uh, the relationship between the West and East. And you ask Pakistanis today, you ask Afghans today, you ask many Arabs today, the popularity of the U.S. is still 
as low as it gets. Connected to right. Israel, it's connected to, to like US that. uncritical it's support for Israel. Exactly, so it's which is why Israel it is an important and fact, Palestine not is central. one of the most important. But also, it's not only that rhetoric isn't enough, yeah. it's the policies. It's not sure. just that he, you know, that, that he's not fixing Israel. It's yeah. what have the policies been in Afghanistan and Pakistan? Makes nice speeches, but what does he do? Sends 30,000 more troops and look at Afghanistan. Even the new US commander of, of ISAF is saying this may not work out. And everyone's been saying a lot worse than that now. Mm. And in Pakistan, Obama's less popular than Zardari, who's less popular than wow. cockroaches, wow. Yeah. you know? <laughs> wow. so, so you've got a situation where if you're talking about this in a kind of take out Asia, take out the pivot to Asia, what have we been talking about for 11 years? Counterterrorism. What is counterterrorism? Well, some people seem to think it's spying and drones. In reality, it's actually taking away radicalism and taking away militancy from the areas that it festers. And if that's how you're going to judge Obama, Western Pakistan, Northwest Pakistan, Southern Afghanistan, Eastern Afghanistan, and then get into the Wahhabi region, there's more militancy and more anger at the U.S. which can create future terrorism. So yeah, we can talk about lots of things from Asia, but if you're talking about the actual impact on the ground of all of these policies, you don't see a lot of people in Pakistan and Afghanistan and moving west who say, you know what, maybe you're right, the U.S. is not declining, we'll trust it more, we'll listen to it more. No, it's actually the opposite. No, I, I agree with you entirely. I mean, it's quite clear that all the efforts by President Obama to talk to the Muslim world, whatever that means, the, the great speeches he made in Cairo, Ankara, I'm a different, I'm even, I've even got a name you must like. Mm -hmm. You know, my name is not Barry, it's Barack Hussein Obama. Where did I get that name from? You know, um, all of that has made absolutely zilch difference in terms of the street in the Middle East overall. I agree with you. I agree with you. My conclusion from that, however, is not that Obama's right or wrong, is that it's extraordinarily difficult to hit the Arab street, whatever that means, and the Iranian street as well. A, as long as the United States, as it will do, and for good legitimate reasons, support Israel, though too much too uncritically. And secondly, because many of the regimes in that region need anti-Americanism. They actually need it domestically. They need it to mobilize their own support and not to get people to focus in on their own, some of their own horrible regimes. Anti-Americanism is very, very functional throughout that region. I, I, I've lived, you know, on the receiving end of, of decisions made uh, in the U.S. Mm. And I think that to some degree when you're a superpower, yeah. you have to accept the fact that you are yeah. always going to be loved and resented in equal measures, sure. perhaps one day more, th one more than the other. Sure. But this isn't going to change. Yeah. Um, and I think that although anti-Americanism is still out there, there yeah. is less animosity yeah. towards the United States today around the world yeah. than there was Absolutely. four years ago when President uh, Bush uh, left power. The polls show that, yes, the U.S. is less popular today than it was in 2009 when President Barack Obama had just been elected, still a bit more popular than <laughs> when President Bush left office, but that's just how it is. But you do have today mm. more countries that are willing to work sure. with the United States in various regions around the world. But this goes straight to some of what I've been writing about, which is that there is a discrepancy between the expectations that people around the world have of what America can do for them mm. and what the United States can actually do. And also, going back to the point that Dana was making, there is a, a gap between the power that an American president actually has and the power he thinks he has when he comes into the Oval Office. And you know, on the Middle East, President Obama did think that just because he was elected, mm. um, he could walk into the room and make the two parties sit together and it would just happen because he was Barack Obama. And because he was <coughs> Barack Obama, the world would now suddenly love America, but it doesn't work <laughs> like that. Mm. And I was quite struck when I read at the end of 2009 or the beginning of 2010, when it became clear that the peace efforts weren't going anywhere, I was quite struck to read a quote by President Obama, he was talking to Joe Klein in Time magazine, and he said, if I'd known it was going to be that difficult, I wouldn't have uh, you know, uh, raised expectations so much on the Middle East peace process. <laughs> and it sort of really struck me that a president, that someone you know, as, as uh, um, brilliant as, as, some, you know, as President Obama could think that the power of his own persona was actually going to make uh, such a difference and that he would suddenly realize mm. that his own power um, had uh, limitations um, it, it, as well. If you'd but been on that 
ride that took only four years from a single speech at the yeah, Democratic perhaps. Convention to, to the Oval Office. Perhaps, you might but that's often the hubris power. of, you know, of power. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, that may be something that John Kerry is going to bump against, bump, yeah, bump up against. Yeah. Because he yeah. thinks as well that because he's John Kerry, because he can, you know, he's the Secretary of State, he can walk into a room and make people agree on whatever he wants them to agree on. But it's not going to um, work like that. But quickly, yeah. it, it, it I, does, uh, policies uh, do, sorry. I just want to get no, I just want to say, I, I, I don't disagree with any of this, really, except to say, um, you know, on the Middle East peace question, if he hadn't taken this assertive and, it turns out, overly ambitious position at the beginning, we'd be criticizing him for his neglect of the issue. This is so, and he, and he, did, he did have a theory about it, leaving aside my slight joke about the power of his own eloquence, he did have a theory which was based on the idea that you have to do this early in your term, mm. latest, because uh, how many stories, ha how many times uh, have we seen presidents, including George W. Bush, late in their term deciding so I must legacy, deal with this right. problem, and they run out of time. Or the Israeli prime minister but he, he gets also indicted. Misread, or he also misread the situation on the ground. The mood that Bibi Netanyahu was in, the yeah. mood that Habas was okay. in, and how the Gaza war had I, I wonder uh, changed. If this is, if, uh, I wonder if this is a, also a function of the narrowness of voices that get to him. If, if he had Rahm Emanuel, who's well, Jewish American in one year, saying, now is the time and you can do it, and he wasn't going to AIPAC meetings because AIPAC hates his guts, he might say, well, Rom says it's okay, I'm going to go give it a shot. If he'd been listening to AIPAC, he would have known that Bibi was never so going to be more down to settle on, on this, because Rahm Emanuel was in the White House in the 1990s with Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. and he saw Bill Clinton spar with Bibi Netanyahu. So his advice to uh, Barack Obama was, <laughs> make sure you show Bibi Netanyahu who the superpower is. Mm. Well, Bibi Netanyahu had also learned his <laughs> lesson right, exactly. from the 90s, <laughs> and he was going to yeah, show so Can we tilt away from the Middle East? <laughs> yeah. 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 Let's, let's tilt back to it. Open you the floor, actually asked the question on the economy. Yeah. I want, yeah, let's I want, get I to, want to come back on to that. I think, I mean, I think there are two fundamental economic problems for the United States externally. I mean, domestically, there has been a recovery. I mean, there's all sorts of talks about shale, shale gas, shale oil, all the rest of it, fracking, energy independence. I mean, actually, very interestingly, the debate about the American economy has certainly turned the corner. Whether this is a, a new moment of hubris or, or not, I don't know. But I remember three, four years ago, you know, the United States was going deep down the Swanee, and now actually the mood has changed quite, quite noticeably. But on the external side, I think there's two, there's two fundamental issues. One is what it says about the European Union and its policies. And clearly, uh, this administration is uh, seriously unhappy um, with, uh, with, with, the, with the policies of austerity which are being pursued in the EU. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and, and of course, by the way, on a, more, on a more localized and parochial sense, deeply unhappy that, that this government may, may be going towards a, an EU exit, which I don't think they will, but I, I think they've made it pretty damn clear to the British government that you don't get out of the EU because that essentially, I mean, uh, you know, w it will change the nature of that particular relationship. But I think the irony of all this, you talked about a liberal world economy, but actually it was the recent meeting with Xi Jinping in, um, in, in the desert. Uh, with the Chinese president, which is crucial to the sure world economy. Is, yeah. I mean, this has been the engine of the world economy, and it's not, it's not a liberal engine. <laughs> and, and therein both lies the paradox and the contradiction. And, and I do want to bring it back to, the, back to Asia generally, but particularly towards, towards China. This is crucial. This, however, also leads me to one other thing why I don't think the United States is in decline. It gets back to this question of the rising power of China. I would almost say literally terrified most of the states around Asia. And what have they done? They've opened up and they've waved a big, big uh, star-spangled banner as large as the Pacific and said, Uncle Sam, please come back. We love you. Please. And in a sense, this does demonstrate some of the real structural power of the United States and its attraction. Because when there are perceptions of threat and dangers, whether in the Middle East, but certainly in Asia, it is the United States which provides that security, or, or purports to provide that security. So it has a, it has a so double whammy, it seems to me, because the Chinese need the United States for that debate on the world economy and world order. But in a sense, those who feel threatened by China within the region also need the United States. And I think that t tells about the recuperative power I, of, of America and time in the world. Questions. Just a very quick point. Um, I think this is a moment of transition yeah. uh, in the world where the United States is adapting to sure. its role as a superpower that is a little bit less inclined to foot the whole bill, do everything. Exactly. And the rest of the world is learning 
how to deal with that sure. and how they need to step up and what they actually want exactly. from the United States. Um, exactly. Dana, you, you were <coughs> going to make a point. You oh no, I, I was no, I was actually just listening. I mean, I was thinking as I uh, that uh, remembering. Uh, I think about a year ago, I heard Lori Friedman make the point on this China U.S. The United States has alliances, strategic partnerships some sort of security community relationship with uh, yeah. something like 70 countries in the world. Yeah. China has the relationship Burma, with North, North Korea. Korea. <laughs> One. No, North so, Korea. So, I mean, this, the this gives you a sense <laughs> of, uh, you know, the rise of China is... Uh, but it's also history we're it, it, it's a security it's a fascinating. Fascinating. And, and relationship. It's a fascinating. And, and China's not going in, you know, with billions of dollars yeah. of aid still. It's yeah. still the U.S. aid. So, I mean, I think, this, I think this is to Mick's point that, you know, the reports of America's decline to the death may be somewhat exaggerated. <laughs> Somebody once yeah, said. I do, yeah, just make, make a point that American society has changed. And it's, I think it's declined since I was a boy growing up in, 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 in the afterglow of World War II's great victory and, and our ability to, to undo a hundred years of segregation. We felt really good about ourselves. I think that America is gone and changed. But I think American power probably is still um, mm. pretty considerable and, and not to be sneered at. Um, I'd like to bring the audience in now. We could talk amongst ourselves for hours. We could, yeah. And it's really you can all go home. It's really right? good. <laughs> but um, let, let's open it up. Thank you. Uh, James Thacker, I'm a novelist. I work with six human rights groups, and as Mick will be surprised at having dealt with you, Venunu with a uh, human index on censorship and with the PRC sure. uh, directly for the Human Rights Watch. I want to actually talk about domestic policy as an aspect of foreign policy. And I agree with you. I identify with what you say if I interpret it that it's a joy to have our first world president now, and that we will have a different kind of president, not like Eisenhower um, after the Second World War. Um, but uh, I, I think we're in round three of the basketball game called Deconstructing Bush, getting out of the wars and whatever. But that the real problem was put, um, had his finger put on it by Gary Wills when he said right at the beginning of round one that if Obama had 36 years in office, he wouldn't be able to deconstruct the security state that had been left by Bush. And there are a million people involved in this. Um, the drones are, uh, are being executed by it. Uh, I should think the Israelis have a role in that, perhaps, one would like to conjecture. We're now hearing from the other Snowden, not the royal family Snowden, but our very own Snowden, <laughs> that we have um, a, you know, uh, an awful lot going on that we don't know about. Uh, Bush is a covert president, and we have the rival covert operation going on. How is Bush going to deal with that? How, how is Obama? Obama. Obama. Yeah. Can, Can I, I jump on it? I mean, wow. I, I, the Bush covert operation Look, the Obama. Yeah. Th th there, is, there is a narrative that, that we can use, which is Obama is the liberal, but there is no getting around the fact that Obama has increased the security state. Ha the CIA is even more paramilitary than it was yep. in January 2009. It's a way of withdrawing from the military situation. Not, well, uh, you, you could argue that, yeah, I but it is something that he has embraced. Make no mistake about mm -hmm. it. It was, of course, created after 9-11. And, and this is why I talked mm. about this speech. Obama has embraced it. He tripled or quadrupled the number of drones. He tripled the number of troops exactly. in Afghanistan. This is something that he has owned. Afghanistan, in many ways, is not Bush's war. He launched it. Obama said, this is going to be my war. And one of his legacies, we haven't even talked about it because no one's talking about it, is Afghanistan is not going to end well. No. Let's be honest, right? So, <laughs> so yeah. So Obama has definitely embraced it. And the question now is, is this speech that he has given, in which he says, let's try and move the CIA out of the way, let's get the drones back to the military, can we really close Guantanamo? Is it going to make a difference? We have no evidence yet that it has, and we have no evidence that the CIA is actually going to be given a backseat when it comes to drones, and the Afghan theater, which includes northwest Pakistan, is still the CIA's territory. David? So, well, I just, I, the security state, I don't know if it was, uh, it was, was really created by, <laughs> by Franklin Roosevelt, I, I, I would say, and it's been... But it's Roosevelt didn't have 1.2 million people with top secret it's access. It's been expanding. <laughs> it, it, you're right. It, it was expanded greatly under, under George W. Bush. Um, uh, the current story is a reflection of the intersection of, 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 of a long tradition of signals intelligence in the United States, a large, huge bureaucracy of signals intelligence 
in the United States with an explosion of signals. I mean, you know, we, <laughs> and, and um, so I, 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 what I try to say in my opening remarks, which I, I just want to repeat because, you know, it was a limited but important thing that Obama said. Stop fighting stupid wars, or stop fighting one particular stupid war, and try to avoid other stupid wars. And there are fundamental ways in which we have, um, you know, violated basic values and, and the laws of war in, involving the torture of uh, terrorist suspects. Now, I my I think the timeline shows that in general the practice of torture had stopped before Obama came into office. But what he did was he explicitly repudiated it. And that was important. Um, what, what is interesting, though, that he did not establish an American consensus against torture. Mm -hmm. we, it's actually a debated issue in the United States still. So, um, you know, that's a problem. And that gets to, I think, a question about domestic politics, which I think, you know, is probably important to get into. I'm puzzled by the statement, though, that um, he's not serious about taking the authority for drone strikes from the CIA and giving it to the military, which is, you know, a modest step, but an important step. The military ha has laws of war, which, it, uh, which is, are embedded in it in a way that is not embedded, it violates them sometimes. It's, it's just pretty simple. The last strike that, that happened, the last two strikes in well, the last week and a half, it, it's CIA. Still. It, it doesn't CIA happen overnight, been, but he said he no, was going to move authority to just one, 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 one very quick point. I mean, actually, we have to say that Bush is uh, uh, Bush <laughs> getting into the same confusion. <laughs> Obama, I mean, has been super smart, really, on this because, in a sense, he's detoxified the war on terror. He's dropped the term, but continued it, and actually has probably pursued it with some greater degree of effect. Insofar as one can measure effectiveness, I don't know, but See, he's in, he's increased the number of drone strikes over Pakistan. Uh, we've seen what happens in Afghanistan, he increased the number of troops by 30,000. He stood four square uh, on a whole bunch of other issues. He's not closed down Guantanamo. I mean, he's been very explicit about what he is and is not doing. And I think we've got to get to the point, and I hate getting to the point, where I don't blame everything on George W. Bush. You know, I want, I want to get to a life where I'm not always blaming G.W. Bush for global warming I, and everything else. Come on, David we, Cameron, we have to take Obama in his, we have to take Obama in his own terms and right. say he's making these decisions. The Republicans did that on and, day and, one. And if counterterrorism, okay. counter counter I'm sorry to say, is not prism and drones. Counterterrorism is draining the swamp of radicalism. Well, I think it's and both. And he talked it's about so, that. So Fine, may it be both. But what he hasn't done is combine the two. I'm, I'm going to stop this and move on to another question. Okay. In the back. Hi, um, Mark Dempsey is my name. Um, the first point I would make is that I think America has found itself in a position where it's quite fortuitous to be the global monitor, so to speak. Um, if it wasn't for the financial crisis, I think Europe might have a common or some sort of common approach to its foreign policy. Um, and you're going back four years in that, in that case. Okay. Um, in terms of Obama, I'd be interested in hearing from Kim, um, what do you think of Obama in terms of his own control over the White House and the people around him? Um, there's been various books written about his lack of control, and obviously or it's clear he's brought in a certain naivety. He thought he had a lot more control or could influence people much more than he actually has. Um, so, thank you. I think he has pretty good control with, within the White House about how decisions are made, and he's the ultimate decider, and he has people around him like Tom Donilon and, at the time, uh, Ram Emanuel. So he does have control uh, within his own White House, but when you're doing foreign policy, it involves uh, foreigners, and foreigners don't always do what you want. So, Damn. you know, it's just something that Dash. is the limitation. Jeez, <laughs> what a complicated world. <laughs> Sorry? I'm not sure it's a lack of understanding, but you bump into it. the reality yeah, of, <laughs> you know, the limitations <laughs> of your own power, and that's Coming just how how it Bush, works. Giving such an elevated yeah. speech in Cairo, but the speech is that a, a speech. But that, but that speaks to two things. One, a speech is just, is just a speech. And I think that he, it's not that he doesn't understand the Middle East, but that he perhaps um, underestimated what it would take to 
get the change going. It's not enough to just make one speech. And that was something that um, Clinton also, you know, Hillary Clinton um, disagreed about with, um, with, with, with President Obama. She's a lot more pragmatic. She's like, you know, what, what's the point of making a speech if there's no implementation? Uh, but when you're, uh, you know, as eloquent as President Obama, you do sometimes hope that that's going to carry forward on its own and that it's going to mm. create some momentum. But the problem as well... No, it's, no, it's not. But the problem also is what are people's expectations of the United States? You know, what are people's expectations of the United States in Egypt, in, in Libya, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan? You know, on an intellectual level, I and, you know, my friends in Lebanon and, you know, people around the world understand that the U.S. can't just push a button to make things happen. And yet people somehow still want Think the that. U.S. to push that invisible button and make it happen. And they want the U.S. to cater to <laughs> their interests. And they forget that the U.S. has loads of overlapping interests that it is trying to um, align. And, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And what I find interesting is that very often, um, you know, there is a lot of resentment towards the United States for, mm. um, you know, because it's, it's a superpower, because, you know, there are different worldviews, because, you know, you can't just come from a different ideology. But some of the resentment also stems from the fact that you're feeling disappointed because the U.S. isn't helping you. You know, look at Syria today. Um, who would have thought that 10 years after the Iraq war, you would have anyone in the Middle East asking for any sort of American, American intervention, military yeah. intervention? I mean, that's quite astounding. It's only two years ago, uh, 10 years ago. And I'm not comparing Syria. Iraq and Syria. They're very different situations, very different countries. And the decision to go to war in Iraq, you know, had its own circumstances. But if you only look at the day after the invasion and the debacle that ensued because of the lack of planning why would anyone today think that if the U.S. just intervened in <laughs> Syria, everything would be okay? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, that's the reality of it, and that's why the U.S. president is under so much pressure to actually do something. And he's having to weigh, you know, well, what is it that I can do that is actually going to make a difference and that isn't going to lead me down a slippery slope towards owning the whole, towards owning the whole problem? And just very briefly, going back to something that we have all just mentioned, is this moment of transition um, that the United States is facing, that the rest of the world is, is sort of trying to come to terms with as well. I spoke to a Syrian... Um, activist, a lobbyist in, in, in Syria, in, in, in Washington, who's really pushing for American action. And I, I put this question to him, you know, why are you asking the U.S. to do anything for you? You know, being a little bit contrarian. And he said, listen, we understand the world has changed. We're not asking for unilateral American military action. We're not asking for boots on the ground. We just want a bit of American leadership. Uh, we want American leadership because we Syrians are dying on the ground fighting against Assad. We will make that sacrifice, but we just want to feel that the U.S. is there with us. And so that's that moment of, you know, a adjustment that has to take place on both sides. There's a gentleman in the back. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, my name's James. Um, it's, uh, if we had this discussion 25 years ago, we'd have probably spent most of the time talking about Russia. And I think that there's an interesting situation between the pressure that America is getting to be more involved in Syria and set against the fact that the Russians are clearly involved in supporting the Assad regime. And I just wonder what the relationship between America and Russia is about and then the sort of dynamics of how that's likely to play out in Syria. Well, I, we had a conference at, uh, sorry, we had a conference at LSE the other day about uh, Russian foreign policy. Maybe I could say a few quick words on that. I don't, I don't pretend to be a, an expert on this. Uh, and I come up with a rather controversial statement that I think brutal uh, realpolitik and Putinista, though the Russian foreign policy has clearly been, uh, Russia has drawn its line in the sand over Syria, and to a very large degree, thus far, that policy, crudely speaking, has worked. Uh, and the Assad regime um, is clearly m very much in debt to what Russia has done. Um, and I don't like the policy, uh, and I don't like the consequences of it, but if we're just judging it from a foreign policy point of view, the Russian strategy, they've actually stopped the rot. And this is what I hear from Russians. Mm. You know, we lost Bosnia, we lost over that, they went into Iraq, they did this, they knocked over Libya. The whole regime change progress in, in, in the Middle East is leading to weakening the Russian. This is our Stalingrad. Mm. 
We, here we go and know. For, and by the way, Russia has also been engaged in a 15-year war against what it seems against radical Sunni Islam in its own country and sees this as part of the same thing. So the Russian strategy, I think, has to be understood, even if you don't, uh, don't agree with it. On the Russian-American relationship, it's terrible. I don't, I don't quite know how to characterize it now because I've just finished reviewing a book about how Russia constructs, the Putin regime constructs its own past in order to legitimize its own domestic policies and its foreign policies today. It's a wonderful book. And really what you've gone back to is what I call a, a kind of late, an early 21st century Stalinism in which you've got enemies abroad, enemies at home, you have a strong statism, and America becomes part of the enemy within that. It's a very, very... Uh, uh, it's a very, it's not a new Cold War, but it's a very pessimistic can view. I, can I ask you, I mean, how much does it really matter? I mean, clearly in Syria, Future. it matters. Yes. But we, we, you know, the, the president's meeting Xi Jinping in the desert, and yeah. that really, really matters. It does. And how much does it really matter if Russia wants to continue to act in this historic faction, fashion, going back even to before the, you know, the Russian well, revolution? Well, it, it, it may matter. I mean, economic... It to matter in Syria. Yeah, it matters in yeah. Syria, yeah. and I think it but matters in all sorts of other, uh, in other yeah. areas. I mean, clearly, the talk over the last 10 years has been China, 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 yeah. Asia, 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 Asia. Russia kind of still is very important. I mean, you know, we, we've been writing it off because the demographics are rubbish. It's only got oil and gas as the basis of its power. That's a geopolitical asset. It has many, very few others. And we've written it off, but we've written it off at our, at our, at our uh, own understanding of the world. Russia still retains this real ability to project some level of influence and power. Mm. Um, it still controls the largest Eurasian landmass. It's, by the way, the European Union is one of its biggest trading partners. And let's not forget that. It supplies oil and gas to most many other countries of Central Eastern Europe and Germany. It bought off a, a, jo a, West, a, German, a German prime minister very recently. Isn't it? I think his name was Mr. Schroeder. Mm -hmm. um, it's a nuclear power. It's one of the P5 members. It can veto. You know, it, it may be a declining power in some sense that the Russia is arise, uh, that China's a rising one, mm. but I think we've really ignored Russia. And I think what Putin is, is saying is putting his hand up and saying, hey guys, we're here and we're, we're, we're going to really do some damage to your interests. And they've got a different vision of this world. They don't want a unipolar American world and they will compromise that. And actually, they've been doing, from their point of view, a pretty good job in Syria. Sorry to say. No, I, I, actually, this is really more of a question. It, 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 the, the Russians have been rather bloody-minded over <laughs> Syria, but um, it does so seem to me if we're not going to have a major Western intervention, um, if the dynamics are leading to endless civil war, then the solution has to be some sort of mm. Lebanization of the country in and, which, and, and in Russia, which Russia would play a role. That's right. They, they so will be at the peace table. That's the yeah. point. That's yeah, the if point. They, if they get around the peace they table. They will be at the peace table because <laughs> they've been in the war. I'm if looking out. I, I see no hands. Right, right, ah, right. Now <laughs> I see some. There you go. We'll come to you in a second. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kit. Uh, a question about counter-terrorism or counter-insurgency in Petraeus terms. Um, with regard to the CIA, I think Obama implemented the, the field manual or whatever it's called, the, the kind of military laws, uh, so he's attempting to address that. Um, the 30,000 troops into Afghanistan, was it was 4,500 were trainers to attempt to try and get the Afghans to kind of take control of the situation themselves. Um, I mean, what could he have done that he hasn't done? I mean, he's pouring more and more and more money in. But Afghanistan seems to be a kind of a drain that absorbs troops, absorbs money uh, with no change. Pakistan is a sort of unreliable ally, to say the least. I mean, what is it that he's done wrong? So uh, the U.S. Uh, has spent, for every dollar it spent in Pakistan, it spent 30 in Afghanistan. Um, the decision to increase troops, you could argue, was the right one or the wrong one. Uh, the decision to uh, increase drones, you could argue, is the right one or the wrong one. But I think everyone would argue that there needs to be more. The people of Afghanistan and Pakistan need to see more than more soldiers and more drones. And I think that most people would say they have not seen more. Now, there are reasons for that, in part because Obama didn't want to spend any political capital on Pakistan, and he probably would have gotten shot down for doing so. Holbrook tried. <laughs> And remember, this was, this was a man who, while his diplomacy wasn't very good in that region and was kicked out of both countries practically, he had a great idea. He said, let's open an American hospital in Islamabad, the capital, 
in Peshawar, the biggest city in the northwest, Lahore, the biggest city in the east, and Karachi, the biggest city in the south. Let's do something that is to visible. put the American flag, even if it's not painted on the side, in Pakistan. Let's do more for USAID and state in Afghanistan. We need to be more than the guys who drop bombs on the people with beards in the Northwest and the people who just send in more guys with visors and helmets who look like Martians to the people of Helmand and Kandahar. Those attempts were not successful. And so there's lots of reasons why, but there needed to be more effort put toward that. And, and Holbrook tried a little bit, failed. Maybe Obama didn't want to. Who knows? There is absolutely no ability within state to risk any of its employees, so very few State Department employees, very few USAID employees would be out on the ground leaving the base. There's lots of host problems we could talk about forever, but ultimately the people of Pakistan would want their lives to be yeah. better 10 years later, and in fact they're worse, and, that, and they judge the U.S. on that. In, in the end, I mean I, I accept all what's being said, but it's all been talking about the war. In the end, uh, counterterrorism comes down in the end to talking to terrorists. That's what it's going to come down to. Uh, I lived in Northern Ireland for 20, 20 odd years, man and boy, so to speak. As you can see, I still survived. Uh, I knew a number of the people who were later defined as terrorists. Actually, I taught some of the best, best, best educated terrorists at Queen's University. They went on to do PhDs and became Sinn Feiners and wore suits um, and, ru and run leisure centers and things like that. Now, Northern Ireland is not exactly the same. I, I, I do accept the major differences, but Jonathan Powell, um, who was a very close advisor to, uh, to Tony Blair at that time, and I, I've got to know quite well, I mean, to, uh, makes this point, and it's crucial, in the end, uh, difficult, problematic, morally repulsive, though it's going to be, at some point, there will be some level of discussion which is going to involve the Taliban, which by definition is going to involve Islamabad, it's going to involve the ISI, it's going to have to come to that, because that in the end is going to be the only way forward, and I find it highly problematic from a moral point of view. Even the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland was problematic. Let's, let's not forget that for a lot of people who had suffered as a result. But I, I think that in the end is going to be but our yeah, only way yeah, out. But Mick, the, the Obama administration never said it would not talk to the Taliban. No, I'm not criticizing and, them. And as, I'm a matter, not criticizing as a matter of fact, conditions. I seem to recall the Bush administration was... No, 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 I'm not criticizing <laughs> I'm simply saying that in a broad strategic, in a broad sense, strategic sense, that's yeah, where, no, that's where we're going to go. But, but Problem that it's going to be. About, no, I'm not, I'm not criticizing. While we're talking about who we talk to, yeah. and we've been talking about Russia, you, you, you're looking at Iran as, as a real problem. Now, the, Russia, the Russian, this is the hold, as, as we know, that you can't just ignore Russia's desire, yeah. actions in Syria, because you need Russia to help shepherd Iran in, into talks uh, with the IAEA. Now, who do you talk to in Iran then, Dana? Who, who does any American president who talk to the reformers, to in Iran? Dana? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, remind me when the elections are. <laughs> tomorrow? Does it matter? Does it matter? Look, I. <coughs> you know, I think you have a, a genuine tragedy here in the sense that. The United, the, the Obama administration, really thinks that it's put um, a serious offer of engagement, of, of 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 strategic engagement, in a sense, the possibility of a grand bargain, the big thing, on the table with the Iranians, and that the Iranians know that. But from an Iranian point of view, we're also practicing economic warfare, um, sabotage. Somebody was assassinating their scientists, although they seem to have stopped doing that, maybe because Hillary Clinton said to stop or criticized it. Um, so many, uh, th that's the first problem, that, that it, it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a psychological dynamic known to international relations theory Secur as, you know, the security dilemma, but plus, laden, plus, plus. laden with so much um, uh, reason for paranoia on both sides. Mm. Um, the second problem is that, uh, you know, every, all, all talk about a deal assumes the best case, in, or not the best case, but a reasonably favorable case in terms of what the Iranians are up to in their nuclear program, which is to say they would be willing to be given a, mm. uh, they would will be willing to accept a deal 
which would give them kind of a virtual nuclear capability, but they would be, you know, not, not go over the line and not weaponize. They may be determined to weaponize. I mean, that's not, you know, there's, a, there, there's evidence both ways. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I had that, when I talked about a shooting war at the beginning, what I was trying to say is that in order to crisis manage or to deal with with the events that were coming and which uh, th that were pressing on him, including a, um, a vi what looked like a very serious Israeli threat to attack, uh, the uh, Obama made a commitment, which is that I will not let Iran develop nuclear weapons. Now he's drawing the line differently than Israel draws draws it, um, and he could go back on it. I think the same thing was say, said about North Korea, and they crossed the line, and we said, oh, okay. Uh, but in this case, I think there will be a lot of pressure to make good on that uh, red line, and and it could lead to another arguably stupid war. And comp complicating matters is the fact that Hezbollah is presumably with the Syrian government massing outside of Aleppo right now, mm -hmm. and if if that happens and Assad survives, you've got an emboldened Iran. With with a real corridor of, of influence, you know, yeah. to draw, what, what draw the map. What, what of the Baghdad interesting things? The war, the war in, the war in Syria. Although, although you one wouldn't thing say you that Iran sure. is looking particularly strong at this point. I mean, I, I understand. Which is why they're supporting Syria. I mean, <laughs> if, for example, but what, what has their support of Syria done for their pretensions to actually, uh, you know, lead parts of the Arab street, not just. Not just the Shia, so. but the whole... Well, it is sectarian. But yeah. I, I would just argue that Iran will be emboldened if Hezbollah fighters help Assad survive. And we will I see I some... Drawing the, wrong it is. Is it, it, drawing the wrong conclusion is something that all yeah, sides that, do that's true. in any conflict yeah. in the Middle East. Kim, quickly? But, but it is important now for President Obama to think through the consequences of President Assad uh, prevailing. Yeah. I mean, this isn't going to be a mission accomplished. Uh, no. Assad and Iran have won. That's not how victory looks like when you operate in these countries. Sure. Victory is defer defined in very, very different terms. If you just stay standing, yeah. even if the rest of the country is burned down, uh, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, but it is a question that the U.S. has to consider. And I'll just make a very quick uh, prediction. I, I don't think that Susan Rice is going to advocate for all-in action uh, because her concern and Samantha Power's concern is also uh, the rise of radical elements in, in Syria and that takes uh, uh, um, over from their concern about you know uh, uh, masses of, of people dying like in, like in Rwanda. But I do think that over the course of the next year or so it's likely that we will see some sort of American limited military intervention that is multilateral and outside of a UN mandate. Mm. Yep. You heard that here the first. Yes, what, one last question. Yeah. Well, the point is, I mean, the, uh, on the Middle East peace process, well, the point is, I mean, surely uh, Obama it soon soon caved into the pro-Israel lobby. I mean, the point is, three months after he made that Cairo speech to the Muslim world, the US was helping Israel to bury the UN report on Gaza. But the underlying context, thought, as far as I can say, is that uh, the Middle East process has been a meaningless charade for, for years. I mean, well, in, in my view, uh, some people's views, uh, you know, ever since Camp David in J July 2000, where the, where the deal was aborted, and the, the violence all f fl flared up soon afterwards. So, so it's, I, mean, I mean, it's a bit meaningless. I mean, I, I read only the other day, Tony Blair making this ludicrous claim that he's working for a Palestinian state. He's just absolute pie in the sky stuff. So, I mean, uh, well, just the underlying point, well, the meaning Middle East process is a meaningless charade. I think I want the speakers to comment on that. All right. Um, you're seeing Kim Perry, you know, engage with uh, Yes. Pr President Obama, from the very onset, said that it was in America's national security interest to get peace in the Middle East. And that showed that he was very serious from the beginning, but that, as we've been discussing, he underestimated how difficult it was actually going to be. I think that what happened um, was that he once he saw that it was actually going to be very difficult because he'd uh, misread the situation on the ground, misread the growing power of the right in, in Israel, um, uh, misread the mood that both Netanyahu and Abbas uh, were in. They're both not really willing to make concessions. I mean, it's easy to only blame you know, America, but the parties on the ground also play, uh, play a role. Once he'd seen those different elements and he understood also that uh, on a domestic front, 
uh, the health care bill was going to be one of his priorities, he chose his battle. He wasn't going to push Congress to back him on a Middle East peace process, which he wasn't sure he could carry <coughs> through, and he decided to fight his battle on health care. I think that's what happened. I, I, we have to, I think, wind this up by 8.30, and I just want to quickly put this last question out, a very specific one. We started generally, and come back to Syria. It's Two years ago when it started, it didn't seem that Assad would last much past Christmas 2011. Guess what? He, he would be done in the same way that Gaddafi would be done. And it didn't happen. <laughs> and now here we are, and it's like, a, set, it's like a, a whole new phase of a conflict. It seems perfectly possible it could go on for another year or two. Bosnia was two and a half years before it ended. And I just wonder, will this actually be something that so colors and demands his time that when people look back 10 years after he leaves office, what they will remember is he didn't get in there in the first six months and look what happened. And, and Kim, I'm going to come to you first on this because you're from the region as well. You still have family roots in Lebanon. If, it does, if things don't improve, Lebanon could, could be sucked in as well. I would like to remain uh, optimistic about my country's ability to avoid going into all-out war. Uh, I think there will be sporadic violence, I think there will be incidents in Tripoli, there will be incidents in Beirut, uh, in the southern suburbs, in the Bekaa, but I think that no party in Lebanon, including Hezbollah, wants to fight this war in Lebanon. Mm. Uh, we always complained during the civil war that others were fighting their war on our land, even though you know the Lebanese were quite happy to pull the trigger. Now the Lebanese are fighting their war on someone else's land, and Hezbollah mm. has gone into Syria. Um, I want to be, you know, I want to be a little bit pretentious and say I told you so, not to you specifically, but I did predict in 2011. Um, when before the revolution actually turned really violent, that President Assad would burn down the country before he gave it up. And everybody said, that's, you know, you're crazy, that's not going to happen. And I asked Clinton, are you worried that this could turn into the Lebanon of the 1980s? And I think she was shocked by my question. <laughs> um, but when, you've, when you come from <laughs> the region, so when you know how uh, the Assad government operates, and when you understand what's at stake for groups like Hezbollah and Iran, um, you really understand better, you know, you have a, a, a clearer view of how these wars are, are, are fought. Um, you know, I won many bets about President Assad uh, staying in power, and it's very unfortunate that we are where we are. I think that in the U.S., yes, they, they miscalculated, they misunderstood, um, you know, the situation, and they thought that Assad would fall uh, sooner, and that's in a way you know, uh, and often a problem with uh, American policies that it is often based on hope that the best outcome will happen. You know, the hope is, tr the strategy is hope, the timetable is hope, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't work like that in the Middle East. Mm. Uh, I, I want to stay away from saying whether it's going to color <coughs> his whole legacy, but I'll just point to one thing in specific that I think we saw in Afghanistan that I think is really, really worrying and does suggest that maybe we'll be talking about this in a long time, mm -hmm. which is, we talk about a country imploding, we talk about 100,000 dead, but we're also looking at the, the empowerment of radicals. Yes. They weren't there before. These, these warlords kind of you know, cut up Free Syrian Army or, or rebels, whatever you want to call them. They move in, they, they take some of the country, and they start looting, they start maybe treating people slightly badly. And then behind them comes real, real radicals, like Al-Qaeda, you know, use that, we use that term so loosely, but really they're kind of linked. And they say, you know what? We're not gonna loot. We're not going to rape your, your daughters. We're not gonna burn the place down. We're actually gonna be pretty nice to you. And suddenly, you've got places where the radicals are popular, where they have absolute popular support, where they're running Sharia courts, I mean, remember Afghanistan. This is exactly what we're talking about post-Taliban. So there is a real risk that you have a section of a country right next to Israel, right in the middle of everything, that has empowered real militants and radicals. And that, we don't know what, what's going to happen long term, but that's really worrying. I'm not sure about that. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, very quick. I mean, I agree entirely with what has been said. And again, it's ironic, don't we? we everybody, America wants to talk to Asia. We end up talking about the Middle East, which I understand <laughs> why. But it does actually demonstrate some of the problems of the United States. Maybe I'm a long-term historical pessimist on the Middle East because I don't live there and I don't have to live with the consequences of it directly. However, the consequences of it will, uh, will and will continue to affect us. There's no question about it. I mean, what has happened in Pakistan, what has happened in Afghanistan, what is continuing to happen in Iran, Iraq, and in Syria is radicalizing yet another young generation, both in the region, jihadis are going there, the, the Russians have calculated over 300 uh, jihadists have gone to Syria, maybe more, they probably calculate maybe up to 500 have gone there. And that's why counterterrorism isn't drugs And then, you know, so it isn't just about drugs, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this will clearly have a radicalizing effect back but on the streets of London, back on the streets of Paris, and back on the streets of Western Europe. It, we know that's the kind of world we're going to be living in. Let, let, but let, let me just is the remind you of the question. I mean, does this, yeah. will this be what he's remembered for, well, well, depends ra on rather than I an inspirational not. speech it, it, followed <coughs> a year later by well, the overthrow uh, of Mubarak uh, from uh, the street. And obviously, so on. it depends on what happens. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, two, three quick responses. To this first, uh, Clinton is not remembered for the shame of. Ro I mean, of course, he's remembered for it, but this is not what is seen as his la legacy, Rwanda. Okay, so horrible things can happen in history and you don't necessarily saddle American presidents. Secondly, just to make a point here, we have, you know, the, the, the name Obama is in the title of this evening. We spent a little bit too much time talking about Obama. Mm -hmm. I think we should all recognize me. I'm probably the most guilty person. You know, he's the, he's the head of one, co one of three co-equal branches of government in a, in a very powerful country, but, you know, the, 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 there's, there's limits to what he can do. Mm -hmm. The third thing, though, is um, to the extent that it's le his legacy, I will, I, I'll only answer that question in a narrow way. I think it's been somewhat surprising to many people how adamant he has been about not getting involved in Syria. And it's something he really seems to take seriously. I mean, he, he, he was moved to act in Libya or to join the action in Libya. Mm. I think he personally has felt that it would be a mistake. Mm. And if, if you think that passivity is morally culpable, then you blame Obama for it to a large extent. Mm. Right. I'm going to have to bring it to a close. It, it, this has been terrific, and I didn't have to work very hard. So I want to thank, I thank, want to thank Kim Gaddis and Nick Schifrin and, and Michael Cox and Dana Allen for sharing their views. And I want to thank you for your questions and for being so attentive. Thank you very much for coming.